One of the pleasures of putting together uh, a, a, a collection of uh, intellectuals and scholars is that you can mix uh, modalities around the same uh, uh, central topic. So we've heard from uh, cultural historian, critical theorists, and musicologists on the question of uh, communism and music and sound. And now we'll have a chance to hear from a colleague uh, working in the field of creative practice, uh, working frequently not just with sound, but I think of uh, Tony's work as, as being a kind of critical theory on sound and histories of sound and music um, uh, pursued through a variety of media. Tony Cox makes video, installation, print, sound, and other works that reframe appropriated texts to reflect upon capitalism, subjectivity, knowledge, and pleasure. Cox de deploys sound as a crucial intertextual element complicating minimal visuals. He has shown works internationally at venues including the Pompidou Center, the Museum of Modern Art, San Francisco MoMA, ZKM, Red Cat, and La Cinémathèque Française. His projects were included uh, in notable exhibitions such as the Whitney Biennial, two and a half times, um, the first Berlin Documentary Forum, Black Male Representations of Masculinity in Contemporary American Art, also at the Whitney, Documenta 10, and Our Literal Speed at the University of Chicago in 2009. His work has been supported by grants and fellowships from the Guggenheim, uh, Rockefeller, and Creative Capital Foundations, the New York Foundation for the Arts, the National Endowment for the Arts, the New York State Council on the Arts, and the Getty Research Institute. He resides in Providence, Rhode Island, uh, where he is a professor and the director of undergraduate studies in the Department of Modern Culture and Media at Brown University. His work is represented by Green Naftali Gallery in New York. Um, I'll say now that following his talk on his own work, um, we'll again have a session of uh, discussion afterwards, so um, you'll, you'll have a chance to ask him more about what we hear about. Um, the title of his talk today is Black Celebrations, Sound, and Vision. Please welcome Tony Cox. Thanks very much, Ben, for the invitation. Also, thanks to Oakley and Damien for inviting me to talk here today. Spectres, Black Celebrations, and Sounds and Vision. Actually, I'm not going to talk about spectres, though in some senses I wish that I could. Um, I have made some pieces that were kind of about questions of ghosting and rearticulation in particular popular music forms. But today I'm actually going to talk about a somewhat different subject. This presentation will discuss my early video, Black Celebration 1988, and another more recent work, Evil 16, Torture Music 2011, in the context of sound as it contributes to the representation of politics. My notes take as a point of departure the soundtracks of the universal newsreel coverage of urban insurrections in US cities in the 1960s. In Black Celebration, the archival images were looped, slowed down, re-edited, then interspersed with text materials from Situationist International and other sources. The archival soundtracks were removed and replaced by three complete tracks from the industrial rock band Skinny Puppy. This talk considers the original archival sounds, which themselves hold a questionable constructed relation to the events the images depict, and their possible relation to the sounds that replace them in my work, Black Celebration. I would argue that the choice of an industrial music soundtrack reflects conditions relevant to the context and process of production, yet simultaneously mimic or amplify some observable aspects of the newsreel's original soundtracks. Um, that's an observation perhaps that I came to in kind of looking retrospectively at the material. Um, it's interesting to me at least that in the last year or so, um, this work has popped up in a couple of contexts in kind of unexpected ways and places, but sound more generally is always an important element 
and it complicates the visual. In this talk, I'll speak via selected instances about how these ideas might operate and construct differential legibilities. I'm going to begin by showing a few clips of the original archival vi video I used in Black Celebration. The subtitle for the work was A Rebellion Against Commodity. Then I'll read some text reflecting on my practice, particularly foregrounding my use of sound and perhaps a few of my borrowed ideas about sound and blackness. Then I'll show a long excerpt from Black Celebration and finally take up some other topics before concluding with a more recent work about the politicized use of sound in popular music in the context of torture. So let's start. Um, could I see the first three files back to back? Four days of rioting, looting, and arson rocked the city of Detroit in the worst outbreak of urban racial violence this year. Entire blocks of homes become infernos. At least 36 are killed, more than 2,000 injured, and damage topped the half billion mark. Governor Romney declares a state of emergency, requests federal troops, and 5,000 paratroopers reinforce the National Guard, state and city police. The city's industry and business are severely affected, and a tight curfew is ordered in the motor center. A besieged city of guerrilla warfare, sniper groups use day and night hit and run tactics before tanks move in to curb their window and rooftop barrage. Wreckage is everywhere. Civil rights leaders make a joint condemnation of the violence and call for an end to the rioting. President Johnson, using firm words, urges the nation's citizens to support the maintenance of law and order. The worst race riots since those two years ago in the Watts section of Los Angeles rocked New Jersey's largest city, Newark, for five consecutive days and nights. At least 24 persons are killed. More than 1,800 wounded, some 1,400 arrested. Despite patrolling by city and state police, millions of dollars in property damage is done. Looters wreck and clean out scores of shops in the Negro Ghetto District. The fury of the mob makes any official-looking vehicle a target. Two days after its beginning, police are augmented by National Guardsmen. Snipers make the streets a battlefield. Governor Hughes terms the rioting open rebellion, just like wartime. Sniper fire from open windows kills two policemen, a fire captain shot in the back while answering a false alarm, and several bystanders. Scores of police, troopers, guardsmen, and civilians are wounded. Officials said the snipers, some believed not to be Newark residents, used guns stolen from a local rifle factory. Even machine guns were used. Because of widespread looting, eight emergency food centers are set up to supply milk, bread, and cereal to besieged and terrorized residents. Looters arrested by National Guardsmen are dealt with swiftly. A 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. curfew is clamped on fully one-third of Newark. While Newark struggles to restore peace and order, the racial bitterness spreads to four nearby suburban towns where a policeman is beaten to death, guns are stolen, looting and violence are reported. New Jersey, a state under siege. Alleged dissatisfaction with the welfare system causes riots in the ghetto district of Boston's Roxbury section. Stores were smashed, burned, and looted in three nights of violence. An angry mob estimated at 1,000 persons marched through the streets throwing rocks and bottles at police, setting buildings on fire. It's Boston's first full-scale riot since the start of national racial tension. Police were not the only target for hoodlums. One rooftop sniper wounded a fireman while he fought the flames. Over 40 persons were arrested. They'll be arraigned following a cooling off period. Boston's Mayor Collins called an emergency meeting with Negro leaders. Uneasy calm follows. I 
am a post-conceptualist and media artist. I've worked for over three decades, mainly with appropriated texts and images to make projects in video animation, sound, print, and installation. I tend to make work about things that really bother me or subjects that I want to think over at duration from a variety of angles. I enjoy aspects of my work, but that pleasure usually springs from the perversity of working through questions and negations. Dissatisfaction and a desire to articulate ideas through working are primary motivations. I have an ongoing commitment to thinking about the forms and context of my work, its modes of practice and presentation, and my shifting roles in making conceptual and media interventions. My practice tends to exist in the displacement between the anecdotal and the theoretical. For me, cultural practice must be grounded in a complex relation to our daily lives as raced, gendered, mediated, political subjects in capitalist contexts. This awareness is also central to my working methods. Appropriated materials and collaborations have haunted my practice for many years. I've pretty much come to accept that my work has no particular characteristics that don't exist within or achieve legibility through social processes. In other words, the effect and meanings of my work happen largely without me. There is nothing unique about me or my ideas. There are no secrets in my work or its methods. I usually work on two or three bodies of work simultaneously. Over the last 20 years, my work has mostly circulated around three broad primary themes, sound and its cultures, arts criticism and representations of artists and cultural practice, and the endless war on terror. But at least two of those concerns, terror and its relationship to sound, actually overlap in Evil 16 torture music, the work I'll show last today. My work has nothing at all to do with originality. Rather, my practice is usually an attempt to use conceptual and media forms to rearticulate or perhaps confuse how daily life and historical events are commonly experienced, constructed, or represented. Sounds, particularly dense and dark electronic soundscapes, but sometimes pop songs, are often an important part of my media practice. In my cross-media work, I explore how sound functions in a complementary, expansive relationship to visual and textual codes. I believe that the sonic register can be deployed to enhance and complicate minimal imagery, supplying strong, nuanced, affective possibilities in critical social contexts. For instance, the Pop Manifesto series, 1999 to 2005, was inspired by my collaborations with Swipe, a conceptual art pop band that I belonged to from 1997 through 2000. Drawing on the legacies and creative work of a wide variety of artists and cultural critics, including Situationist International, Deleuze and Qatari, Jacques Attali, Kraftwerk, John Baldessari, Dan Graham, Seth Price, Michael Bell Smith, and Richard Serra. These works blur the boundaries between music video and art, critical analysis and advertising, history writing, and polemic. The series was an exploration of the power of pop music, its audiences and markets in realizing, distributing, and selling for a profit certain ideologies and key emotions of the late 20th and early 21st centuries. The structure of the work encourages the viewer to re-examine their experience of rock music and its history. An idea of generic music that appears throughout the works refers to a form of music, pop music, that is less about love, raw emotion, or personal expression than it is a symptomatic project and feature of life under post-industrial capitalism. Black Celebration, a short case study. Given the historical and political orientation of these events, I thought it might be useful to, to revisit an aspect of my own observations with recorded sound and visual textual representations of political events. So I'm redeploying a work of mine that seems to have become legible in new ways recently. The recent visibility of Black Celebration perhaps responds to particular conditions like 
the Black Lives Matter movement in the US and recent debates there and elsewhere about images of black trauma or the, po the proper or improper use of these representations in artistic contexts. Okay, at this point I'd like to show the last two thirds of Black Celebration in its four, thank you.
When I started making Black Celebration, somewhere around this time in 1987, I was interested in sounds, but not the original pop culture or subcultural 1960s sounds, but the then contemporary late 1980s sounds. Though I've often worked with archival material, I rarely work with a soundtrack from the same period as the imagery or text. Industrial, electronic, sampled sounds and noises were part of my listening palette at the time, and Skinny Puppy's Mind, the Perpetual Intercourse was a favorite audio cassette. Aggressive post-punk affect was a register just wrong enough for the way I wanted sound to relate to images in Black Celebration. Strangely, the work was originally produced as a silent installation. The video was initially projected silently with text and photo image panels. This was a strategic, rather willful, arbitrary decision that I made. I knew that the video would be presented in a space near two other media art projects, by, each by different artists. I didn't want to be involved in negotiating the sound bleed issues, so I deliberately completely muted the sound in the work's premier context. Originally, I thought of the three music tracks by Skinny Puppy as a structure to edit my images against, a kind of, a kind of ghostly or hauntological rhythmic armature for pacing the visuals of course, I changed my mind about silence and released the work with sound as a single channel video after I realized that those initial circumstances might never occur again, and they haven't. The video seemed rather effective with sound and a lot more contextually portable without the other visual elements. In the last two decades, my practice has been oriented towards a series of short works organized loosely around a concept. My decisions are often contextual or strategic, and I rarely produce work and release it in the sequence in which I conceive it. I enjoy working on a number of small modules rather than large-scale projects with stable beginnings, middles, and ends. Installation versions sometimes develop where several works belonging to a series might be shown simultaneously or in staggered looping arrangements. I am in no way a card-carrying modernist, but I heavily appropriate its forms. Presentation formats are always thought about and open to revision, depending on the context and the audience. There is no singular optimum viewing condition. I tend to work with the conditions I find rather than demand stability or perfection in these matters. In retrospect, it now feels like my soundtrack decision for Black Celebration was a bit of a knowing, exaggerated amplification of the wrong genre music present in the original Universal Newsreel soundtracks without the voiceover. The video transfers of the films had the sounds of jazz and orchestral tracks, evoking film noir dramas, military spectacles, or B-movie, sci-fi, or horror genre movies, but not serious political upheavals, black insurrections, or rev revolutionary politics. The newsreel soundtracks were more like music for a crime film or alien invasion, and rather than try to paper over this perceived error in judgment or this deliberate, ideologically charged misreading with a normative ideological law and order voiceover, why not embrace it, or rather exceed it in the visual register with a text collage from Situations International, fragments of pop music lyrics from Depeche Mode and The Smiths, and then close with quips from artist designer Barbara Kruger. I thought at the time that I wanted to produce a flawed, unreliable, desiring counter-memory about those 1960s rebellions not a classically researched and argued documentary that rationally presented the causes, aims, successes, and failures inscribed in the events in Watts, Detroit, Boston, Newark, and elsewhere. In many ways, I thought I was not positioned or equipped to make a rational argument about the events, but I could make an affective, less than fully coherent, allegorical screed. 
during that period in my life, and to some extent even today, I was fascinated by the problematic of how violence is represented when people, not the state, enacts it. The text selection from SI's The Decline and Fall of the Spectacle Commodity Society was useful in critiquing the newsreel's content in a way that would never be a part of the official news context. I mean, it's also interesting to think about what is not included in the visual repertoire um, of this, these materials and often aren't in representations of these events. Usually, you know, they're aftermath images, not images um, presented from the perspectives of the participants. There are all sorts of things missing, and I thought that maybe I could highlight that in some way. In the 1980s, I was particularly angered by the ways in which I thought the 1960s rebel rebellions had been evacuated, dismissed, disavowed, or even partially recuperated by 1980s conservative mainstream Reaganite, Thatcherite, white cultures. I sensed that these events were not simply irrational violence, disposable fashion, accidents, or in any way like natural disasters, or antiqui antiquated debates more abundant and always already resolved. Rather, these events sprang from deep historical wounds merely gloss glossed over by prosperity for a few, an urban crack cocaine invasion, an interminable fake war against it, and a rising tide of hip hop and gritty street glamour. At that time, I wrote that I wanted to make a piece about how people make history under conditions constructed to dissuade or exclude their participation in it. And I also wanted to put the lie to the illusion that racial violence was a relic of the past. Perhaps that's in part why black celebration may seem so contemporary now. Even though I knew that the situation analysis I deployed didn't tell the whole story and might not comport with the account the participants in those events might give, it made what I thought was a useful intervention even if that usefulness was far from total. Personally, I saw a connection between a critique of commodity culture and the position of many US blacks from slavery until the present. Black rebellions perhaps are symptoms, or as, as I might say, a critique in acts, or the return of the repressed of slavery, that constitutive operation of what we now should all know as global capitalism. Returning to sound, some may wonder why I deploy industrial rock music in a video referencing 1960s black struggles. For me, blackness is both rock's center and its margin. I would contest that punk, industrial, or another rock genre is some, I, wouldn't, I would contest the notion that punk, industrial, or some other rock genre is somehow less imbricated in blackness than rock's preceding modes. In my world, blackness is constitutive. Blackness is neither irrelevant nor accidental. Blackness is everywhere. It haunts and it repeats. Or it repeats, then it haunts. Even when blackness is absent, silent, or invisible. And non-visibility is a concept that I'm exploring in some of my more recent Absent, silent blackness may still frame conditions of possibility for its coded white other, or for future sonic, visual, textual, or material legibilities. Like the soul circulated via black vinyl records that are heard, repeated, then tweaked and recoded locally, not just in Detroit, or in Memphis, or in Chicago, but in Berlin, or Kingston, or Munich, or Johannesburg, or in Manchester. In black music, listening is not passive. It is a distributed productive process or technology. This idea clearly informs the intertextual work that sound performs in my meter practice generally, where sound is often deployed in complementary or antagonistic relation to the allegedly hegemonic visual or textual elements. 
For me, sound always encodes labor, desire, history, and other social processes. Therefore, my work is a zone where sound is neither natural nor neutral. In my dis multidisciplinary practice, sound is consistently at work, complicating other signifying systems. I'd like to close with a brief commentary about, and by showing a bit over half of the opening of a 17-minute work deploying music and text called Evil 16, Torture Music, which I will show in its, well, the, I'll show an excerpt. It takes excerpts from an article by Mustafa Boyami that was originally published in The Nation magazine on December 26, 2005. Bajami is a professor of English at Brooklyn College, New York, and has written several books exploring Arab-American identity. When I was a fellow at the, Getty, at the Getty Research Institute in 2009, I found this particular article to be a key and cogent text in a then-developing body of reportage and scholarship devoted to the military use of music and sound as a weapon, a form of, tech, of psychological manipulation, <laughs> or torture. Originally, I planned to make a collage of various theoretical and journalistic sources, but I was drawn to the ways Bayami's text, pithily entitled Disco Inferno, deftly combined scholarly and journalistic modes. The soundtrack features a playlist of songs or artists documented as being used in US psyops and torture programs. I really look forward to your questions and comments after this last presentation. Thanks for your attention. And you can play the last clip.
levee was dry And them good old boys were drinking whiskey and rye Singing this'll be the day that I die Let the bodies hit the floor 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 Waving your banner 